Yes, sir. So we'll send you the YouTube link if you if if you. Yeah, like that'd be nice, actually. Watch. Thank you. I'd like that'll to. Later, thank you. Yes, sir. So have you done this series before, or is this the first time you've... Uh... Oh, sir, this is, not, this is the first time for our society. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a pretty new society. We established in 2018 and started working in 2019. Mm, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. And, and of course, Delhi University has a lot of colleges, right? Different, uh, um, uh, different colleges that are constituent of the whole university. Yes, sir. Um, exactly, sir. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, and but the colleges are not specific to um, to subject. You could have people doing many different subjects in. in yes, sir. Right. They are not not course specific. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So you are the geologist from your college who, who um, you know, you happen to be the geologist from your college, and this is your society. So that's no, no, sir. Uh, it's actually. Uh... A society of students. I'm not a geologist. I'm a student as well. Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Right. 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 I oh, aspire okay. to so yeah. Just people who are interested in geology. Ah, oh, that's even better, actually. Yeah. Uh, great. So, how is the situation in Delhi with the virus now? Um, so the curve has flattened quite a bit. I mean, uh, three, four months ago, it was getting very bad. I mean, we were getting almost 1,000 cases every day. But now I think the curve has flattened uh, a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good, yeah. Available, uh, but it's okay. It's six twenty-five, so we'll start at six thirty. It's six twenty-five okay. right now in India. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So Rahul, will there be many people who are like you, who are not um, geologists by, uh, you know, by discipline? Uh, it's I mean, actually a mix of people. They are going okay. to be students, and it's uh, it's meant to be a student fest. We also have competitions happening side by side. Uh, right. But we have in personally invited many professors and research scholars as well, and they'll be joining in as well. Okay. Yeah. No, I just um, uh, you know it helps me understand what kind of you know. Uh, background people might have, you know, so uh, uh, I want to, you know, be sure to uh, uh, not to, you know, be too technical or something. Yes, of course. If, if there are. So, so are you planning answer. to, to yeah, think yes, that sir. if this is a success that you will do more of these? Uh, yes, sir. Um, we'll of course do more of these. We'll, we'll try yeah. to make it a monthly thing. Yeah, no, this is a good, a great, great thing. I did similar thing in Kolkata a few um, for presidency um, university yes, a few a few months ago, and yeah, it's great. You know, because it's all I have to do is get up in the morning and come down and <laughs> talk to you, and that's lovely. You know, it's it's yes, a good. A very good situation. Um, one of the few good things to come out of the, uh, the pandemic. Yeah. Yes, uh, one of the few good things. <laughs> so before it begins, uh, um, well, can I ask you a question? I mean, uh, uh, why did you decide to come to Shantinigetan in the first place? <laughs> oh, that's a long uh, story, but um, um, the the answer is uh, yeah, there's a lot, short versions and long versions of the answer. Um, um, 
you know, I grew up, I'm like Morris, of course, I'm a British uh, originally. And um, I did have um, through my mother's side, you know, some family connections with ancestors who, you know, been in India during the Raj time. And so, you know, we always grew up with India as this special, exciting place. Um, um, but really what happened was that I was involved in high school at, in a, um, a, a refugee um, sort of refugee situation in uh, Bangladesh. Um, and uh, this was um, the uh, people who were called there the Biharis. So these were people of Muslim origin who went to Bangladesh um, in 1947 during partition. Um, and then of course they were Urdu speakers and when liberation happened, um, uh, obviously the Bengalis very understandably were um, not very sympathetic to these people. So, um, but there was a big problem um, with, you know, what to do with these people and, you know, to go to Pakistan or what. And um, my a friend of mine in high school, his sister was married to a Bangladeshi businessman. And we kind of got involved in humanitarian stuff on that. Um, and, and, and then as a young man at 18, um, I came to India and uh, uh, to visit Bangladesh and India and Nepal. Um, uh, with uh, this this friend, and uh, um, it had a <laughs> transformative effect on my life. Um, and uh, in Dhaka, I went to uh, with my friends uh, an evening of Rabindra Shangit, and uh, I heard about Tagore at that time. And then I became kind of fascinated by uh, India and by uh, Tagore. And uh, so I decided after I finished at Durham University, where Morris was a professor. Um, I uh, I would take a year and and come to Shantanuketan and and, uh, and enjoy being there and um, uh, study a little. So uh, that's what happened, and it was a great decision, one of the best decisions I've ever made. Yes, sir. I mean, it's great that uh, India is having influence over people from ev each part, everywhere around the world. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> great. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's 6 30. Uh, we'll start in a I think minute or two. Okay. But yeah. friends are still joining. Yes. Sir. Uh, I think we should begin, yeah, right, to begin. Okay. To begin, I'd first like to quote some lines from the song, Lemon, the Passing of the Trial of Ice, which was written by Professor Hughes when he was defending his PhD. Come, hear the tale of the trial of bite days. Niche is exploited in so many ways. Where did they come from and where did they go? I just spent three years and I still do not know. I am Rahul Bhandari from Ramlanan College, BSc on a second year, and it gives me and TEDx immense pleasure to host Professor Nigel Hughes in our annual event titled Washam 21. Professor Hughes is currently a professor of geology at the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, University of California, Riverside. 
Professor Hughes is a world-renowned paleobiologist and his research focuses on the early Paleozoic history of South and Southeast Asia and its implication for understanding the evolution of the Himalayas and the development of the paleobiology of trilobites. He has had a long and running relationship with India and is associated with the Geological Studies Unit of the Indian Statistical Institute. Before completing his doctorate at the University of Bristol in England, he took a year off and went to Shanti Niketan in West Bengal. His time there offered inspiration for a book he later wrote titled Monisha and the Stone Forest, about a young Bengali girl who interprets the natural history of the fossils near her home. It was at this village where Professor Hughes learned to play the ukulele, which he continues to do today. I would request all the participants to stay muted during the entire session for the smooth conduction of the webinar. The link for the question form and the feedback form will be provided in the chat box of the Zoom meet as well as the YouTube live stream. Without any further ado, here's Professor Nigel Hughes. Uh, Namaskar. Uh, may both come Hindi Janahu. Uh, uh, but uh, I will, uh, I'm, I'm afraid my Hindi is far too poor to attempt to. Uh, uh, to uh, do any presentation in Hindi, but uh, um, uh, it is a real pleasure to be here and thank you for this invitation. It's one of the few benefits of this terrible uh, situation that we're able to make these connections and I'm very uh, excited about that. Let me just uh, see if I can uh, share my screen here um, and find the, uh, there we go. Yeah, and put that, uh, um, so I'm very pleased to hear that uh, from Rahul that your uh, organization has a wide variety of different people um, and not everybody is a geologist. So um, I'll attempt to uh, make this talk accessible to as many as, uh, as possible. Um, but uh, uh, my talk is about really uh, the work that we've been doing for some 30 years on understanding the geology of the ancient Himalayan margin, the ancient geology, and then how we can apply that to understanding exciting things like the uh, uplift of the mountains and then their erosion. Um, as, uh, as Rahul uh, mentioned, um, I do have an association with ISI. As you see at the base here, I was on sabbatical last year and actually had to return early when the, the virus hit um, on a Fulbright Fellowship. Um, but long before that, I was uh, an undergraduate, as you all uh, are, um, and my professor at that time, or one of uh, my professors at that time, was uh, our previous speaker, Morris Tucker. And Morris was a brilliant and inspiring uh, professor, much uh, loved by um, all who, uh, who were lucky enough to be taught by him. And uh, if he's still on, um, uh, I send uh, greetings from uh, you know, uh, uh, all of us who are still uh, in touch. Um, the infamous Adrian Hall, um, uh, he will remember well, um, and uh, uh, our best wishes to Morris, and uh, what a, a lecture to have to follow up on. Um, but uh, my lecture is a little bit closer to home, um, and of course we have connections between um, UCR and uh, University of Delhi that go back for a long time. Um, uh, our, our great friend and, and mentor, uh, Diraj Da, Diraj Manaji, of course, um, and uh, Mihir Deb, and many, many people, um, uh, GBR Prashad. Oh, I should just say, I received a, an, e an email, just received an email from uh, Professor Prashad asking, could he be connected? So could somebody please send him um, a link um, to uh, GBR Prashad um, because he would like to join the, um, uh, join the lecture? Um, but of course, we have a very direct connection um, uh, now in um, uh, one of your, uh, your own, uh, uh, Shravya Shravastava, who is, who is now a uh, PhD student at uh, UCR and who uh, visited on the Indo-US Science Forum. And um, we're already making great progress with uh, her PhD. Um, so we have a lot of connections, um, uh, not just specifically to India, but also to um, the University of Delhi. And so that's a great um, excitement to us, uh, to us all. Um, but today we want to talk, or I would like to talk, about, of course, one of the most spectacular regions of the world for having its geological history, and that is the Indian subcontinent. And there's so many things about Indian geology which are special, um, but of course one of the most striking of all is the world's highest mountain chain, um, the Himalayan mountains. Uh, and we all know that that's the result of the breakup of Gondwana 
uh, India moving at breakneck speed, 20 centimeters a year at, uh, at some points of its history, northwards colliding with Asia to force up the Himalayan mountains. Um, a major physiographic feature in the, in the world today. Um, but of course, that history, that long history of movement and collision um, is a complex one, uh, but very important to learn about from the point of view of our understanding continent-continent um, collision. It's the best example in the world of that. Uh, so we need to understand the dynamics of such a complex interaction. And uh, our work has really been on um, trying to approach that question of India's collision, which began about 50 million years ago. Um, our approach to understanding that has been to try and look at the earlier history of Indian, the Indian margin, the northern Indian margin, when it was part of Gondwana land, to understand that in order to apply our understanding of what the ancient margin was like to understand the current and ongoing uplift and, and collision and erosion of the Himalayan mountains. And I like to try to argue today that an understanding of that ancient history is absolutely crucial to understanding the more recent history of India's collision with Asia. So here is um, what's called a lithotectonic map um, of the, the Himalaya. It's uh, representing the major packets of rock units that are separated by major faults. And this is um, the, the north here is the Yalong Sangpo suture zone. So that's the suture zone with the Lhasa block of Tibet. So that's the geological northern uh, margin of, uh, of India. And then we have, as you can see here, uh, four lithotectonic regions, a blue one, a red one, a, a green one, and a yellow one. And then uh, south of that onto the Kraton of India itself. Um, but the Himalaya itself made of these four lithotectonic zones, each of which is separated by a major fault system, the South Tibet detachment system or South uh, Tibet fault system, um, the main central thrust that separates um, the uh, blue zone, the Tethian Himalaya, which contains sedimentary rocks, um, from the high-grade metamorphic rocks um, of the greater Himalaya, which is shown in red. So these are um, very deformed rocks. Some of them were originally sedimentary, some of them intrusive, but they're all really deformed. And then on the southern side of that, um, uh, we have the main central thrust. Um, so we've got the South Tibet detachment system here, the main central thrust here, and the main central thrust separates the greater Himalaya, that high-grade metamorphic rock, from another largely sedimentary series called the lesser Himalaya. Uh, and so we've got sedimentary rocks here and sedimentary rocks there, and between them, this high-grade rocks. And then uh, to the south of the lesser Himalaya, sorry, uh, to the south of the lesser Himalaya, we've got another major fault system, the main boundary thrust, and that separates this uh, layer of sedimentary rocks, this zone of sedimentary rocks from the Shivalik hills, the very young um, tertiary Shivalik hills, and then to the south of that, the Himalayan frontal thrust, and then we're on the Kraton of India itself, the Indian Fallen Basin and, and the Vindians and core India. Um, so this is the basic structure of the Himalayan mountain chain. And you'll notice that uh, in addition to the colors, um, I've got some names of places here which are in boxes. And these are places in which rocks of Cambrian age, so long before the collision 50 million years ago, but uh, in fact, 10 times around five, 500 million years ago was the Cambrian. Um, uh, but there are Cambrian rocks that are outcropping in quite widely across and along the Himalaya. And this is why my focus has been on the Cambrian, because of all Paleozoic systems and of all Phanerozoic systems, the Cambrian is one of the ones that has the widest distribution, both within individual lithotectonic zones. So you can see here how in the blue zone, we've got lots of localities that are of Cambrian age. 
And we've also got them across the lithotectonic zones. So we've got them in the blue zone, we've got them in the, um, uh, in the uh, green zone, the lesser Himalaya, we've got them in the, the salt range of Pakistan, and even we have Cambrian rocks in Dulmera um, uh, on the Indian Kraton itself in, in, in Rajasthan. Um, so this is great because these rocks are all of Cambrian age, of similar-ish depositional age, right across and along the origin uh, and onto the Indian continent itself. And so we can make comparisons of rocks that we know have similar depositional age. So that's why the Cambrian is really important for our understanding the ancient history of the Himalayan margin. And um, this is an important issue because, of course, um, the uh, history of the northern margin of India is part of a tremendous history, which is the building of Eastern Asia as a, as a continental mass. Of all the regions of the world, India itself, or Africa, or here, Laurentia, um, all these areas are made, of course, all these cratons are really ancient. They're uh, assembled in the, in the Proterozoic, or even parts of them in the Archaean. And it's really only the Eastern Asian region which is the only major craton of the world that has been assembled in the Phanerozoic, when we have the opportunity to look in detail about that history and a good geological record and fossils to help us date things and all sorts of advantages of that kind. And so this history is very complex. And as you um, who are geologists may know, um, parts of Tibet were originally parts of the northern margin of India and then broke off and then um, moved across, hit Asia, and um, uh, later India followed. So um, a, a model was published some years ago by a distinguished American um, uh, stratigrapher and tectonic geologist, Pete DeSells and colleagues, um, that looked at the structure of the Himalayas um, that we've just talked about in the last slide and had in mind that kind of model of pieces breaking off the northern margin of India and moving across the Tethian oceans and then colliding. And this is the basis of the model that uh, DeSells and his colleagues published. Um, and I'm showing here the same set of colors that I showed you in those lithotectonic um, uh, map uh, in the last slide. So here's the south, here's Cretonic India, and here's the north. And as you can see, these five zones are represented. And let's just talk about the basis of this model. So here's the blue zone, the sedimentary rocks um, that I mentioned in the northern part. And they're sitting um, across the South Tibet detachment system now on the uh, deformed rocks of the greater Himalaya. And in, in the DeSells model, this is a sequence of sedimentary rocks that were deposited unconformably originally on an older basement of red rock material that's now uh, metamorphosed, maybe in this model was metamorphosed before these rocks were laid down on top of it. Um, and, and so that's what we would call a, 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 a basement cover relationship, sedimentary rocks sitting on this. And then um, as we cross the main central thrust, you'll see that we're crossing from what's called the greater Himalayan terrain here um, into these uh, rocks that again of sedimentary origin in the lesser Himalaya, and then onto the Indian shield itself. And the key point about the DeSells model is that what the main central thrust is today is a continuation or a representation of the original tectonic boundary between a separate greater Himalayan terrain, a little bit like the Lhasa block or the Chaitang block of, of Tibet from real India. So the, the story I'd like to get across to everybody here is that this stuff here is real India, and this stuff is part of a separate microcontinent that broke off perhaps from northern India or maybe came from somewhere else, but is, is not originally part of the North Indian margin. And so this was an important model. It was published in in 2000 in science. It's an interesting one and um, um, definitely worthy of consideration. And so what is the evidence then 
that um, Desselles and his colleagues used for uh, invoking that idea? Well, what he did was um, study sedimentary rocks and take from those sedimentary rocks the grains, um, plastic rocks, of course, the grains of zircon. And as you may know, zircon is a very hard and very resistant mineral. Um, and so it can undergo many cycles of uplift and erosion. Um, and in any sandstone we look at, or even sand on the beach, there's very likely to be zircons in it. And we can take those zircons and date them radioisotopically using the uranium lead method and get a, an age for that particular zircon. But it's very unlikely that that will be the only zircon in the sample. Usually there's hundreds of zircons if we take a big enough sample of sandstone and break it up. Um, and we can date all those grains. And then we can get a profile of ages of the zircons. Now, this is not like in a volcanic rock where hopefully all the zircons formed at the same time. We're going to get a range of ages that represent the sources of material that was entering the sedimentary system when that sandstone was um, forming. So what we've got here is um, on the y-axis, the numbers of grains, and on the x-axis here, the ages of the grains in samples taken from the blue zone, that's the Tethian Himalaya here, um, the northern zone, from the red zone, from the uh, rock that was originally sedimentary but now is metamorphosed, but luckily we still are able to uh, date the ages of the zircon grains. Um, uh, so that's from the red zone. And then here is the green zone rock. And I think you can instantly see that these two profiles, um, the upper one and the lower one are very similar to each other and they have a lot of young grains in their ages. Um, whereas this one here is obviously strikingly different and it has no grains younger than about 1.6 billion years old. Well, it can't have because the depositional age of these rocks is, I'll just have to move my picture, yeah, 1.5 to 1.8 um, uh, uh, billion years. So we couldn't have any young zircon grains of this age is here because the depositional age of the rock is is way too old, whereas this is a Cretaceous rock. Um, still, um, it is clear that the only part of the Himalaya that has these really old sedimentary rocks is that uh, lesser Himalayan, that green zone um, kind of uh, region. So um, oops, let's uh, uh, go back here. So what uh, we started to do as Cambrian uh, specialists um, was to think about um, that issue of depositional age and see whether we could use the power of the paleontological record as an independent estimator of depositional age to collect samples from these different lithotectonic zones that are of the same depositional age. And so this is um, what is the, the result when you do that. And this is that here is a sample from the lesser Himalaya that is of Cambrian age. And here is a sample from the Tethian Himalaya, the blue zone that is of uh, Tethian uh, uh, um, origin from the, the, the Tethian rocks of Cambrian age. And we can compare their detrital zircon record. And we see here that when we take a Cambrian rock from the lesser Himalaya, it has a whole host of young zircon grains. And in fact, the profile is not really strikingly different from that of the Tethian Himalaya, either in the Cambrian or in the Cretaceous, or from the Greater Himalaya. The big difference is within the Lesser Himalaya and is reflecting the depositional age of these two um, uh, units within the Lesser Himalaya. So in our view then, this argument that Desselles and others have put forward that the Lesser Himalaya is fundamentally different from the zones to the north, the red zone and the blue zone to the north, and that young material only occurs in this uh, material to the north is, uh, is incorrect. But um, that's a matter that might be debated. Um, one could argue, is this material really 
part of the, the Lesser Himalaya, or could it be something that was thrust from the north uh, down into that region? Maybe it's a sneaky piece of the Tethian Himalaya that somehow got in there. That's a, that's a possibility. Um, but to address these kinds of issues um, and uh, doing so within a constrained stratigraphic interval of time, that has been our kind of task. So um, what I want to now do is to just talk to you about uh, investigations of the Cambrian, um, a little bit of the adventure in doing that, and then come back to the question of what we have learned about this to uh, assess that question of the relationships. Now, the first thing, of course, is that the Himalaya is a great mountain chain. And of course, even the best preserved sedimentary rocks um, can't escape the effects of uh, the greatest orogeny in, in the last uh, you know, 100 million years. Um, and so um, there are various challenges. These are uh, fossils from Koman, um, trilobite fossils. And the one on the left is the fossil as you see it uh, in the field. And the one on the right, we have applied a retro deformation um, technique uh, using the computer to try and restore the original uh, symmetry to this uh, animal to try and get an understanding of what the original shape was was like. And I should say, of course, that there has been a very long tradition in the Geological Survey of India and then after independence more broadly in the new institutions um, uh, across India in doing paleontological work and geological mapping um, and uh, GSI can, of course, continuing to do that. Um, this is, we mentioned the, my early history, uh, this is the Geological Survey of India on the very first day I was ever in India in 1982 as a young man of 18. Um, obviously things look different, you'll know there's a bypass and the metro and all those things if you know this area. Um, but uh, um, it is in the Geological Survey in Kolkata that the original specimens that were described by officers of the Geological Survey of India are still housed. And one of the important things that we should do is not only do new field work, but also go back and look at the original specimens and update our understanding of their taxonomy and relationships, because of course the science has moved on. So um, I have spent a lot of time in Kolkata over the years um, looking at the original collections. Uh, and I just want to tell you one story about a fossil that I started looking at um, relatively recently um, it was the kind of last of the Cambrian fossils that needed to be looked at again. And this is the specimen. There's a five uh, rupee uh, uh, piece. So you can see that it's not that big. Um, and I wasn't terribly excited about this specimen because it didn't really look like much. I could see these kind of rays coming out like this. And, and there's a kind of a sort of concentric aspect to this. And I, honestly, I thought that this was um, maybe an iron concretion. You can see all the siderite on the, uh, the, 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 the top there. I thought, you know, probably wasn't a fossil at all. Of, uh, here is a fossil. Here's a, a brachiopod. Um, uh, and then we've got these funny kind of like tubular structures. Um, but uh, I made a cast of this um, and uh, then looked in a little bit more detail at the, at the cast um, back here at Riverside. And I began to convince myself that actually these uh, divisions uh, in the margin were, were really very regular and unlikely to be the result of some kind of inorganic uh, uh, process. Um, uh, then there we had these tubes. They obviously look uh, kind of um, organic in, in structure. Um, and you feel that this is part of a large circular structure that's obviously incomplete. And I began to realize that this was actually um, India's first Cambrian soft-bodied organism. Trilobites, of course, and brachiopods have a hard skeleton, biomineralized skeleton. But the Cambrian's become very famous in recent years for the rare occasions of soft-bodied preservation. And these uh, enigmatic organisms called Eldonians um, are part of that soft-bodied flora, fauna. Uh, this is one from Kunming in uh, uh, the lower Cambrian of, uh, of China, of, uh, uh, of the Yangtze block of China. And you can see that it also has this radiating striae that are regularly spaced. 
and also in some forms, this kind of concentric uh, ring. Um, and what's real uh, dead giveaway is that many of these, um, after they seem to have settled on the seafloor, seem to have become um, sites for scavengers to come and start to burrow their way through. And that's exactly what we see in that other specimen. We see those same sinuous trails um, uh, as are seen in, in these modern Eldonians. So um, that was really a, 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 a nice experience for me to look at something that I didn't think was anything and then find out that uh, actually this is an interesting and important um, fossil in India's, India's first Cambrian soft-bodied um, organism. But of course, looking in collections is, can only give you certainly, uh, you know, a certain li limited am amount of, um, of, of information and to go into the field is really important. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, have done that many times in the Himalayas um, with colleagues. Uh, uh, this is S.K. Parcher from the uh, Wadia uh, Institute um, crossing the Parahio River by uh, coat hanger. Um, and we, we thought we were kind of a little bit adventurous uh, doing this until uh, um, we uh, saw what happened to our, our, our donkeys having to, to go across. So this is up um, in the Spiti uh, area. Um, in the days that we were doing this work in the um, early 2000s, it wasn't too long um, after uh, foreigners were uh, allowed for the first time into this region. Absolutely spectacular um, uh, uh, geology and superb exposure. Um, and uh, here is the, the succession, the lower Paleozoic succession. This kind of uh, darker rocks are Cambrian with some nice red dolomites um, uh, occurring here. And then you'll see there's a purple uh, set of rocks. They're quite thick. And uh, you might be able to see that there's actually an angular relationship. There's uh, an unconformity between these Cambrian rocks and the Ordovician rocks, and then up into um, the Silurian. And here's the famous Muth quartzite. Um, so beautiful exposure in this area. And we um, did, as the uh, earliest worker on these rocks, uh, uh, Henry Hayden did, walk up the north side of this valley, um, uh, collecting uh, fossils as we, as we went. So here you can see we've ascended. We're looking across at the Muth Quartzite, going bed by bed, uh, recording the sedimentology with my colleague Paul Myro um, and uh, uh, collecting fossils. Um, I should uh, hasten to, um, I'm not smoking a biri here, um, that's actually a pencil, um, but traditional work, hitting on rocks with a hammer, collecting fossils, uh, and um, uh, collecting sandstones for detrital zircon uh, dating, um, and uh, our role of, of my uh, uh, group has been particularly the paleontology. Um, and uh, this has been uh, very uh, rewarding for us. Um, we've looked, of course, mainly at trilobites. That's my uh, main speciality. But along with them are many other interesting fossils, small shelly fossils. Here's a, a, a form that we had the um, honor of, uh, of, of, uh, of naming after uh, Dirajda um, and uh, brachiopods. Um, so these phosphatic forms, easy to separate from the limestones by dissolution. Um, but uh, the main uh, tool that we've used for stratigraphy is uh, the trilobites. Um, and we uh, have found, uh, particularly in limestone layers, um, a, a good fauna um, and uh, quite a large number of new taxa. And this is one that's named after our dear friend, uh, Shamali Kustagir. Um, now, I don't want to go into details of all the biostratigraphic zones and, and things. Um, because that's uh, um, specialist stuff. Um, but we have been able to establish a stratigraphy um, through the Cambrian um, for the Himalayan margin um, and recognize a series of levels that are characterized by um, particular fossils. Here's the, the famous Arictocephalus indicus, first described from the Spiti Valley and now the official uh, uh, marker um, for the, the, the base of the third series of the Cambrian system, a name now known all around the world um, because of uh, the importance of this particular fossil. And we can correlate, I know I'm not for the slightest expecting you to look at anything here, except that this is the Himalayan zonation. And here is time. 
And what I just want to point out is that all these are different regions of the world, South China, North China, Australia, Kazakhstan, Siberia, Laurentia, Sweden, Avalonia. And we're able now with pretty good confidence to correlate the rocks that we find in the Himalaya with equivalent age rocks uh, around the world. And so India's uh, uh, Cambrian geology is now secure in the context of that of the rest of the world. Um, but what I want to talk about really today, because it's of more um, broad geological interest in general, is what all this hard work doing um, recognizing the, um, the, these issues is uh, what the implication of this is for the younger history of the Himalaya. So uh, here is the section in, in Zanskar, um, so a little bit uh, to the west of, of Spiti. Um, and it's the same sort of successions of rocks that we were, were looking at in the slide of Spiti. The Cambrian is mostly this kind of darker uh, sandstones and shales, um, but there are layers of striking red dolomite that occur within it. You can see some of them where my pointer is. And um, here in Zanskar, but not preserved in Spiti, is a very prominent uh, 250 meter interval of dolomite, very striking horizon called the Tidzi member uh, um, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, Kasha formation. Um, and it's a very striking marker bed, um, lithostratigraphically, it's very evident. Um, now, this, of course, is all in the Tethian Himalaya, so north of the South Tibet fault system. But as we go along the Himalayan margin towards the east, that fault system cuts to higher stratigraphic levels. Now, I, I know some of you are, are just interested in geology and not professionally geologists. So what does that mean? It means that rocks that are um, on, in the blue zone uh, in the western region become on the, in, in the red zone um, in the more eastern region because the fault doesn't just uh, uh, have lower rocks. It, it, as we go towards the east, it cuts stratigraphically higher and higher. And so rocks that are Cambrian uh, in the blue zone um, become uh, rocks uh, that are in the red zone as you go further to the, uh, to the east. Um, and if we look at this mountain, uh, Trumulumwa, uh, Sagamatha, um, also known as Everest, uh, what we see is something very interesting. And that is that um, you may know that the top of Everest is limestone. And in fact, it contains trilobites, this summit pyramid. But the famous yellow band that occurs um, on the shoulder of the summit of Everest is about uh, 200 meters thick and it's yellow and it's made of carbonate, very much like the Kasha formation. And it's sitting on top of a huge thick series of shales and sandstones, but they're very deformed, of course. Um, these are schists, um, but that's a very thick succession of sandstones and, uh, and shales originally, sedimentary rock originally. And um, uh, so this is interesting because this succession is very similar to that which we've just seen um, in Zanskar from which trilobites occur. But of course here, there's going to be no trilobites occur occurring in these rocks because these are strongly deformed and part of the greater Himalaya. So we can't expect in such deformed rocks to have any chance to find fossils because they've been too deformed. But we have been talking about another tool that we could use to um, investigate uh, some control on the age of this material, and that is the detrital zircons. So why don't we take a sample from here, just below the uh, yellow band, um, and see whether the zircons that occur in these metamorphic rocks, but rocks that were originally sedimentary, how does that compare? How do those zircon profiles compare to those from the trilobite bearing rocks that we were looking at in Zanskar? And when we do that, they are dead ringers for each other. So here is 
the uh, profile from sandstones just below the Kasha formation. We know the depositional age of these from the trilobites. And happily, you know, the Cambrian, this part of the Cambrian about four, about 500 million years ago. Um, this is nice because the youngest zircon grains we have in the sample is just a little bit older than 500. Um, so that's, uh, that's reassuring, that should be the case. But we've got a nice spread of ages, just like we were showing um, in the, the previous uh, shot of detrital zircons uh, and ages and various peaks here. What about those metamorphic rocks that were originally sedimentary from the, um, uh, from the, the Everest? Um, uh, well, uh, we can't find fossils in them, but we can look at the zircons and look how similar these profiles are. And look how um, the ages of the youngest zircons are almost identical. This succession of metamorphic rocks in the um, greater Himalaya, in the, in, in the uh, Everest region, and to the uh, east along the Himalayan margin, is the same set of rocks as are occurring in the blue zone in the Tethian Himalaya to further to the west, because the fault, the South Dipet fault system, cuts up section as it goes to the east. And that's important for the DeSelles model, because remember that DeSelles model was that the red zone was the basement, and on top of it was a sedimentary sequence. Um, of the blue zone. Well, that can't be the case if these rocks are the same depositional age. These are actually the same sequence of rocks. They've just experienced a different history. So that is our, our first um, piece of evidence that suggests that that model may not be um, fully securely founded. Um, just to repeat, the blue zone in this model is shown as sitting on top of the red zone in a cover basement relationship, but actually, Rocks in this, this zone here are the same age as some of the rocks in that zone there. So that's not a, a, a secure model. Now let's continue then this kind of comparison south as we go into the lesser Himalaya and then into the uh, sub Himalaya and then onto the Indian Kraton itself. So here's the uh, lesser Himalaya. Um, these rocks are at lower elevation. Unlike the Zanskar Spiti area, there's a lot of vegetation, it's harder to find fossils, um, but we can indeed uh, do that, and there are fossils that are available to us, and so we can take the detrital zircon grains um, from uh, those, and we can also um, look at what's occurring in the uh, sub-Himalaya, in the salt range of Pakistan, and um, even in Cambrian rocks in, in Dulmera, um, in, in Rajasthan, uh, near Bikaner. Um, so this is the situation in the, the salt range of, of, of Pakistan. Actually, this is the, the first part of the Indian subcontinent where Cambrian rocks were uh, discovered. Uh, so this is very classic uh, territory. Um, and what we can do in this, um, I'm sorry, um, is to use our trilobite biostratigraphy that we've established um, for the Cambrian uh, to not only say, let's compare rocks of Cambrian age, but let's try to compare rocks within the Cambrian of as close a depositional age as possible. Because then we are normalizing for um, differences in time. And we want to see whether those zircons are, are, are really different, those populations are different. Let's compare rocks that were all laid down at the same time to see whether those differences are real. So we could do this for the blue zone, the Tethian Himalaya. We could do this for the um, green zone, the lesser Himalaya, both in the um, Kral Tal belt and in Abbottabad in, in Pakistan. We could do it for the salt range, um, which is the sub Himalaya. And we can even do it for Nagar, um, which is uh, in the, uh, on the Kraton in, uh, in Rajasthan and compare these detrital zircons. Now, when we do that, when we look at the sections, um, the the uh, lithologies and the thicknesses of the sections, of course, vary because the craton um, is proximal, and during the Cambrian, the seaward margin of India extended to the north. So it's no surprise that the thickness of um, sedimentary record is much greater 
um, in the Tethian Himalaya than it is in the Lesser Himalaya or on the Kraton itself. That's what we'd expect. Um, a thicker deposits, more um, uh, offshore, and uh, thinner, more condensed deposits onshore. We'd also expect there to be differences in the lithologies, um, because of course, just as today, we get different fasces depending where we are on a proximal to distal uh, transition. So we do indeed see those things. Um, for example, in the lower Cambrian, um, we see the drowning of a carbonate platform in the Neoproterozoic, and then a, a very phosphate rich um, zone um, that are on the uh, craton side um, of, the, uh, of that division from proximal to distal. Um, as we go into more deeper water, we don't really see that uh, concentration of phosphate as we get to the edge of the carbonate platform. But we can compare the detrital zircons from rocks of similar depositional age all the way from the Tethian Himalayan margin through the Lesser Himalaya, through the Sub-Himalaya, and on to the Kraton. And remember that Deselze's argument um, for the his explanation for why there were young zircons in the Cambrian rocks of the Lesser Himalaya was that really those Cambrian rocks were actually uh, pieces of the northern zone, the Tethian Himalaya, that had been thrust uh, into the south. Well, is that a credible model? Well, the answer to that is no, because we see the same kind of signatures of young zircons with prominent peaks here around 900 or 1000, whether we're in Tethian Himalaya, whether we're in the Lesser Himalaya, whether we're in the Salt Range of Pakistan, and whether we're even on the Kraton. There's no way that these rocks here at Mawa were thrust anywhere. They're sitting on the Indian Kraton. And so they show definitively that during the Cambrian, there were zircons of these ages on being deposited on the Indian Kraton, just as there are as we go progressively more and more distal. And the idea that any rock that has young zircons in must be a thrust piece of this greater Himalayan terrain is, is clearly not uh, really acceptable. So taken a, a long time to, to kind of address that issue. Um, but here's our reconstruction then uh, published a couple of years ago in GSA Bulletin of what the northern margin of India would uh, originally have looked like. We've got uh, in the Proterozoic, we've got the successions of the, in the Vindian, um, uh, and those continue at subsurface in the Indian Fallen Basin. And in fact, the very old rocks of the Lesser Himalaya um, are uh, correlative with those uh, sequences that we find in the Fallen Basin and exposed in the, in the Vindian. And that's most of what's exposed in the Lesser Himalaya today. And that's why we get um, some rocks with just very old zircons. But in, uh, in, in some places in the Lesser, Lesser Himalaya, in little pockets um, of places that have not been eroded yet, we also get the younger history, the Cambrian history or the Neoproterozoic history with a big carbonate platform and then this condensed interval, the Tal uh, formation, tal phosphates that Dirajdar has done such a lot of work on, um, uh, uh, occurring sporadically in the, the Lesser Himalaya. But then as we go deeper uh, uh, north towards the margin, um, we, we reach the edge of the carbonate platform and we come into um, the uh, succession that I've been showing you the pictures of, um, in which we don't have that carbonate platform. We have occasional carbonates like the, the, um, the 200 meter one, um, but uh, um, but we, we have a more distal succession and thicker succession that's occurring over here. And this was the original form of the margin on which the, all the, the fault systems of the Himalaya have um, subsequently developed um, uh, uh, upon this. So, um, so what's the implication of this? Uh, this is now, uh, as much as I'm going to tell you about what the ancient history of the Indian margin was in terms of its Cambrian record. Why is this useful for the um, subject that I put in the title of the uplift and erosional history of the Himalaya? It's useful because um, when we look at the Himalaya today, of course, 
we see what is not being eroded. When we look at a map of what the Himalaya is, it's the rocks that have not been eroded from the Himalaya yet. But if we're to understand the history of the Himalaya, we need to understand what was there and has subsequently been eroded and when it has been eroded. See, there's a major question in um, world sort of geochemistry in the uh, tertiary. And that is that if you look at the um, isotopic ratios of osmium and uh, strontium in the world's oceans, um, there's a, a change in both of these properties, the isotopic ratios, at, 11, uh, at, uh, at 16 million years. You see how it's basically steady state here, and then it starts to go up at this point here. And there's a kink also in the strontium curve. So that means something important happened around the world at 16 million years ago. So we want to know what the source of that could be. Is it some change in global weathering rates that's occurring at that point? Or is it something localized? Is there a major but localized uh, effect uh, that's occurring at 16 million years that could cause this? Well, if it's got to be localized, what candidates could there be? Well, the Himalaya is a great candidate because it's a major mountain chain at low latitude. So it's being weathered. We've got the monsoons. There's lots of erosion. We all know that you know, the Himalayas is being uplifted and, and materials being swept out into the Indus Fan and the Bay of Bengal. So if there's any local part of the world that uh, could be expected to be causing this transition, it would be the Himalaya. But the problem is, that Himalayan geology, um, when we look at it, doesn't seem on the surface to suggest that anything important happened 16 million years ago. There's a big change at 11 million years ago. Um, uh, that's the point where um, it seems like uh, movement uh, skipped. Um, as India collides into Asia, of course, um, the crunching happens. And the first thing that happened was that the South Tibet um, fault system um, started to initiate, and that allowed material to pile up as India banged into Asia. But what happened then, several million years uh, after that, is that so much material had piled up that pushing up those mountains um, of the Tethi and Himalayan zone was requiring um, uh, too much mechanical force, and so the fault skips to the south. So the first fault is the South Tibet detachment system. You build up enough mass and the fault skips to the south, to the main central thrust. And then that collision continues and you build up more. And then the fault skips to the south, to the main boundary thrust. So the, um, the, the interesting events in Himalayan history tectonically are when do those skipping events take place? And um, the Lesser Himalaya, it has generally been believed that the Lesser Himalaya were uplifted at 11 million years. 11 million years is here, and it doesn't really have any break in the signal that's anything that's striking. And so it's hard to relate this pattern to anything that's happening in the um, Himalayas. On the other hand, is that really the full story? Because what we know about the Lesser Himalayas is that, um, yes, what's exposed in the Lesser Himalaya today is very ancient rock that contains only those very old zircons. But we also know that in certain areas, there's Cambrian rock that was deposited on top of that very ancient rock. And there's every reason to think from our reconstructions of the Cambrian that originally there was a broad swathe of Cambrian and Neoproterozoic rocks and possibly Permian rocks too that covered the entire region. So the question is, when was that material eroded? So this is um, an analysis that's been done by uh, Cody Collips and Ryan McKenzie. Uh, Ryan was my student and uh, Cody is the student of, Ryan, of Ryan's looking at the um, uh, ability to date the timing at which Cambrian rocks in the Lesser Himalaya cooled 
uh, they, as they um, uh, are buried, of course, originally, and as uh, India collides with Asia and these rocks are uplifted, they, um, uh, be, the erosion takes place. And eventually those rocks, those buried Cambrian rocks are exposed again. And as they um, become exposed, they cool and they trap helium isotopes as the result of radioisometric decay. And so we can use isotopes again as a measure of at what time particular rocks cooled. And uh, the result that we get when we do this is absolutely fascinating. The very old rocks, the rocks that were deposited a billion years ago, those show cooling ages of around 11 million years. So it's clear that those very old rocks um, were brought up to the surface about 11 million years ago. But when we look at the cooling ages of the Cambrian rocks, what we see is that they were brought up to the surface about 16 million years ago. And when we look in the fallen basin to see the ages of detrital zircons um, that are uh, representing the erosion of these products, we see that in the uh, Dharamshala group here, um, we have a, a, a swath um, of ages, cooling ages that represent 16 million years. So what does that mean? It means that 16 million years ago, the lesser Himalaya or portions of the Lesser Himalaya began to be exposed and they were then subsequently eroded. So what were those rocks that were uh, exposed at 16 million years ago? Well, they're the tile phosphates. And what is the tile phosphates full of? Well, it's full of radiogenic osmium. That's, what, that's why we have the phosphates there. They're super condensed sitting on top of that carbonate platform all that very special phosphate material super condensed in osmium. And when we model the amount of, um, of osmium that there would have been sitting in the tile formation along the entire Himalayan margin as it would have originally been, it's, it, it's enough to account um, for this, this transition. So the point is that in our uh, general models, people have assumed that the Himalaya had nothing to do with this transition here because it's at 11 million years that those very old rocks come to the surface. But they came to the surface at 11 uh, million years because they followed the exposure earlier, 5 million years earlier, of the Cambrian rocks that contain uh, all that uh, radiogenic osmium. And when we look then at the uplift history of the rocks that are um, the younger Neoproterozoic and Cambrian um, ages, we can see that all these areas here have ages around 16 to 15 million years. Whereas the really older rocks, um, uh, the, the ancient uh, Lesser Himalaya uh, uh, rocks here in, shown in brown, have uplift ages that are around 11 uh, million years. And the model um, that um, Cody and Ryan uh, and, and Paul and I and others have put together is that here's the original margin. There's the Indian craton. Here's the proximal area with the carbonate platform and the uh, phosphatic bank. Here going into more distal areas, um, we start to uh, initiate India's compaction against Asia, um, thrusting uh, starts to occur. We move the MCT um, uh, here up until 16 million years. And then the fault breaks to the south. And this material, this material that's rich in radiogenic um, osmium and strontium um, is brought to the surface and starts to erode. And so this signal then enters into the fallen basin. And then at 11 million years, we've eroded some of this material. And also there's what's called out of sequence thrusting. The tons thrust brings up this ancient basement material to the, um, to the surface. And so when we do the modeling, as I said, uh, the volumes of material make sense. Now, only today, 
in the Himalaya, there are just rare pockets where these Cambrian rocks are, are preserved. And so nobody's paid much attention to them, except for Dirajda, um, uh, because they're not volumetrically today very important. But they were extensive along the original margin, and they can reconcile this history. Their erosion can reconcile this history of what's gone on in the Himalayan region being responsible for that major change in the world's oceanic chemistry at 16 million years. So this is a case where uh, studying the ancient history and doing things like traditional paleontology and uh, timing and ages of the rocks, careful stratigraphic work can uh, have a real implication for much younger geological history with all the exciting things that go on in the Himalaya, which is of course the best example that we have in the world for this kind of continent-continent uh, collision. So just um, if there's any, uh, just a, f a few moments left, um, I'd like to uh, just finish off by, by talking about what Rahul uh, mentioned in the, in the beginning, and that's, um, uh, you know, I've, I've been extremely privileged and fortunate to work in the Indian subcontinent for much of my career, and it's something, you know, the opportunity to do that is something I treasure. Um, and of course, we've been keen, therefore, to uh, spread our enthusiasm and joy um, about India's geological history. And, you know, if there's any part of the world where you want to feel good about, you know, the, the, the natural history, where it's so spectacular, where it's something that every citizen of the continent, no matter which country they come from, no matter what religion, no matter what caste, can feel good about, you can feel good about the geological history of India because there's nowhere uh, on it like nowhere else on earth like it. And so this, this, this sense of the importance of the history is something that we've really wanted to, uh, to share with people. As people who've come from outside and discovered this uh, for ourselves, what you have um, uh, for yourselves uh, is your, your kind of birthright. And so um, uh, this, this enthusiasm for sharing the geological history is something that, we, um, that we've tried to pursue. Um, so uh, in Bengal, uh, I, I, as was said, I was a student at Shantiniketan. Um, there's a lot of this, Gachpatur, um, fossilized wood. It's a strange material. On one hand, it looks like wood. On the other hand, um, it's made of stone. So there are all sorts of um, stories about it. It's very familiar to, um, uh, to, to people in the villages. It's people who live in the countryside who know about this material. Here are the village boys sitting on top of piece of Gach Pator. Uh, of course, because it's strange, um, it's recognized as uh, unusual. And here it is as a takur with beautiful uh, flowers um, being um, uh, dressing it at uh, Ghosh's uh, Chadokan. Um, and so we wrote a story about a village girl, Monisha, and her um, attempts to find a natural explanation for this, uh, this Gach Pator. Um, there are all sorts of explanations from different traditions, from Adivasi tradition, from Muslim tradition, from Hindu tradition. Um, but Monisha wants to find a natural explanation. She's a very um, observant uh, person. Um, and she uh, has a series of adventures um, that take her ultimately to the hot springs at Bokrasha. Um, and she uh, gets a splinter in her finger and a piece of wood that's been sitting in the hot brines um, at the hot springs and finds that it turns to sand because it's being solidified. And then for this, um, she gets a fever from that um, wearing a wet shari. And then she's visited um, by a hati, um, but not a normal hati, but uh, uh, by a gomphothir with four tusks. Um, and this uh, hati takes her back to the Mayo Pliocene boundary at the time when the Gachpator were living and she meets the various different animals that were uh, alive at that time. Uh, she's, of course, chased by a Nimravid cat um, and returns to tell the tale with, uh, with her family, uh, illustrations by uh, Roti Bashu from Shantiniketan. We've had a whole load of fun um, doing programs uh, 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 about this. Um, I took two students from UC Riverside who were both Bengali speakers. Um, 
uh, one uh, Hindu lady, one Muslim lady, which was which was very nice. Um, we had great fun with the uh, student, uh, with the uh, with the kids. Uh, here's a kid looking, and uh, you know, um, it's just such a privilege to work with these children who are so bright and so inquisitive. Um, the story got made into a. a uh, 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 anim uh, uh, drama um, and uh, toured, um, and uh, we've had uh, help um, in assessing the impact of this and uh, what we could learn from it. Um, and I just want to finish by um, by saying what we're you know thinking about at the moment in terms of geoscience outreach. We learned a lot from Monisha Pathorebon. Um, we had five thousand copies that we distributed, five thousand Bengali copies that we distributed for free. Um, but one of the things we learned is that, you know, the, the language requirements in order to understand the concepts, you know, are quite challenging. Um, and yet geology is such a visual story and such a dramatic thing. I mean, that's how I became a geologist was watching a program at nine, when I was nine years old about, you know, plate tectonics, which was very early in those days. So uh, recently we've teed up um, with Shekhar Mukherjee, who is the director of the uh, National Institute of Design in Vijawara, um, and was a longtime cartoonist for uh, Nanda Bajar Potrika, um, and uh, Trisha Banerjee from uh, Drishtikon Art House, um, to think about, oh, and students, of course, from, uh, from NID, uh, here's Manchi Singh, um, to think about uh, trying to tell the story of India's geological history um, in, a, in a way that doesn't require uh, students to uh, to read and through fossil characters um, and uh, what better than a trilobite from the top of Sagamatha um, uh, to do that. So this is our, our project that's in process um, uh, talking about India's dramatic history um, and we're having a lot of fun uh, putting this together and trying to um, uh, trying to get uh, uh, sponsorship um, to uh, to make um, an animated series that would be um, freely available over the internet um, uh, and uh, uh, accessible to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to people. And as, of course, we know, now um, uh, cell phones are widely available in the villages of, of India. Um, and our target is to make this uh, available freely um, so that in villages across India, um, you know, when um, the kids are sitting out there, someone has a cell phone and, you know, maybe uh, uh, gathering around, they'll come across um, this series and some child will be fascinated by it and moved by it and it will affect um, their, their ambitions um, and, uh, and their life in, in the future. So I hope I can just put this, this up here and, and you'll be able to, to, to just see this. And close then with the... Uh, um. The top of the Sagar Matha wasn't always a high mountain. Long, long ago, it was the bottom of an ancient ocean. And when big storm came, the sea floor was covered. Nusha, do you want to meet someone special? Who has been in this place far longer than anyone else? Really? It doesn't look very special to me. Professor Hughes, sorry to interrupt, but your screen is not visible at this moment. I'm sorry? Your screen is not visible at the moment. Oh, the okay. Story. I'm sorry. It's yep. much longer than the story of all the people who have ever Ah, lived. okay. Sorry about that. I was hoping it would work. No, sir. It's okay. It's to uh, let me see if I can stop this. Then. Okay. Um, let's quit out of that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry that uh, that that hasn't happened then. Um, are you back? Okay. Let me just. Okay, so you, sorry, were you not able to, you weren't able to see that then? Yeah, so we were not able to. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, you know what I'll do? I will um, uh, see if I can uh, just put the, uh, put the, the, the link then. Um, 
oops, uh, I will uh, see if I can put that link in um, in 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 the chat box, um, so that you can. Uh, I've gone on long enough anyway, uh, so uh, uh, anybody who wishes to, to 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 see that link, I'm sorry, um, uh, you know, should be should be able to see that. So I encourage you, please, to to look at that um, because. Um, we 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 you know we have various plans to try and um, uh, persuade the um, various organisations here to to give us funding to allow us to make this series and make it freely available. Um, and with that, I uh, I have finished. <laughs> so we have Manika Rawal asking the questions uh, that have been put forth by the participants. Thank you so much, sir, for this informative session. So I'll be the moderator of the day and I'll be asking questions on the behalf of participants present here. So first we have Dr. Hamidullah from Women College, Pulwama. He says, kindly help me to understand how MCT, MBT and HFT are simultaneously tectonically active when the stress in the Himal Himalayas is moving northwards. Yeah, well, thank you, yes. Um, so I am not a, a tectonic uh, geologist. Um, I'm a stratigrapher and paleontologist. So um, my um, uh, my ability to answer your question, um, in, you know, with uh, with uh, you know competence and 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 profound information is uh, is limited. Um, but um, uh, yes, of course, this is a you know you're ramming the Indian subcontinent into Asia. Um, and that's a you know extraordinary dramatic kind of thing to do. Um, it's thought that uh, it, as India moved northwards, um, it moved across some hot spots that delaminated um, the basal part of the crust in India, which allowed India to move very fast, um, um, and that's you know, responsible for the, the quick movement of India and the continued um, uh, uh, progress of India northwards. And so, of course, as it's progressing. Um, it, it's ramming uh, in, uh, northwards, and there's stress, you know, through much of the Himalaya. Um, so um, there will be continue to be um, stress amongst the the older uh, structures, as there is uh, amongst the newer structures that have broken to the south. Um, uh, and you know what happens on individual faults will depend on the particular dynamics in that region. The South Tibet fault system is now a normal fault system. So actually, those um, those Tethian rocks are now actually moving to the north. They're moving downwards to the north um, uh, because it's got piled up to to such an extent, and collision is is concentrated or the accommodation is concentrated to the south that those high mountains are now slipping to the north. Um, so uh, what was a reverse fault during initial collision is now a, a normal fault. Um, so the dynamics of of individual movements in individual areas, um, you know, is the stuff of of, uh, of tectonic geologists. Um, but the the um, the basic sort of dynamics of that, I think we can we can understand how you know there there will be movement not necessarily just on one fault, and there might be you know a, a, a normal fault movement occurring as a reverse fault movement occurs in some other part of the Himalaya too such a complicated uh, mountain system. Yes, sir, it was quite helpful. Now, next we have Rahul Bhandari from Ramlal Anand College, University of Delhi. He asks, are the fossilization processes in the greater Himalayas different from that in the lesser Himalayas? If so, then why? Well, in, in the greater Himalaya, um, that's the red zone in, in the story, um, that rock uh, has become particularly strongly metamorphosed and deformed. So although the detrital zircons still keep their signatures, unfortunately, the fossils that would have been in those rocks are completely gone. They're sheared, they're, they're, they're so sheared that you can't even have a trace of them. So there's no chance of us, um, of, of, of us being able to identify them within there. Um, the, the, the red zone, um, is very interesting what has happened in that particular region. Um, and there's a, uh, uh, my colleague and, and, and friend, Mike Searle has done a lot of work on, what, on what's called, and many others on what's called channel flow. 
And there's an idea that in that red zone, there's a kind of conveyor belt of material passing down and up. Um, and this strong metamorphism um, uh, occurs in, it's really concentrated in that particular region. So, um, so uh, no fossils in the red zone. Um, uh, say comparing fossils in, the, in, the, in fossil preservation in the Tethian Himalaya, the blue zone and the lesser Himalaya, the, um, the green zone, um, basically the, the styles of preservation are not too different. Um, the, um, and you know, this problem of squashing tectonic deformation of the fossils that we've tried to sort out a little bit with the retro deformation, that's a, you know, that's a pretty common thing. Um, different rock types preserve in different ways. So limestones are more resistant to that shearing and they have better 3D um, preservation. Um, on the other hand, in limestones, the trilobite fossils are all broken up. You know, when I showed you pictures of trilobites, you probably were, some of you were probably a bit disappointed because you didn't see all the segments. Um, and, uh, you know, you think of a trilobite with a head and segments in the middle and a tail. Um, but normally we find trilobites as bits and pieces because the skeleton has broken up. In the Himalaya, in the muddy rocks, sometimes we find complete specimens but they tend to be squashed. Whereas in the limestones, we find bits and pieces, but they tend to be well, quite well preserved. So there are, there are uh, differences. Uh, ah, looks like uh, something's going on with the, with the, with the, with the video. Great. <laughs> yep. We can either watch that or we can ask more questions. I don't mind. <laughs> I think first of all, we can watch that. Top of the Sagar Matha wasn't always a high mountain. Long, long ago, it was the bottom of an ancient ocean. And when a big storm came, the sea floor was buried. Murshad, do you want to meet someone special who has been in this place far longer than anyone else? Really? It doesn't look very special to me. You think that oh. these mountains have always been here, don't you, Nushrat? Of course, they have. The Earth story is much longer than the story of all the people who have ever lived on it. Learn to read the layers of the rocks to meet those who lived in India during that epic voyage. Sorry, uh, uh, it seems like the uh, the images are kind of jammed. In there, but I suggest that you look at this yourselves. <laughs> It's the story of our subcontinent's past, which belongs to each one of us. Get ready for Bhutishuti and Nushra in the ocean on the top of our mountain to take you on to the true adventure of 100 crore lifetimes. Yeah, it seems like, uh, yeah, you know, at least here, I don't know whether you were able to see it, but it seems like slowed up. But, uh, you know, you've got the link. I put the link in the um, in the chat box. So anybody who is interested to uh, to look at that, hopefully, um, yeah, uh, you'll be able to, uh, uh, you know, um, get uh, get it to show kind of continuously um, uh, if you try a few times. So. Sorry, sir, we apologize oh, for no, this inconvenience. Uh, don't worry about <laughs> so. that. It's, it's part of life, right? Okay. <laughs> yep. So let's move on. Next, we have um, Shah Rukh from University of Delhi. He asks, is there any special uh, pattern of seismic events from Northwest Himalayas? Oh, seismic events for, from Northwest Himalayas. 
Um, I, I'm not a, 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 a seismologist. Um, um, I do, would recommend that for your uh, uh, future uh, one of these, you might ask my uh, colleague here, Abhijit Ghosh, um, who's our, um, uh, our size, one of our seismologists here in our department. I'm sure uh, Abhijit would be very uh, happy to give uh, a lecture and uh, um, he's a very good speaker, so uh, I, I recommend that. Um, <coughs> in terms of uh, seismic uh, issues, um, I really can't, uh, that really is a long way from my area. Um, but uh, of course, seismic risk is associated with India's plowing into Asia. Um, and one of the things that uh, I enjoyed recently hearing Abhijit speak about is that he uh, was part of a team or led a team that after the Nepal earthquakes a few years ago, um, were able to go very quickly and deploy a set of seismometers in uh, the Kathmandu Valley and, and more widely um, that were able to monitor the after effects of those earthquakes. And one of the things that, um, that delighted me about what Abhijit did um, was that he provided the first um, subsurface seismic evidence for the kind of crinkling um, of rocks in the lesser Himalayan zone that we were suggesting in the um, in the the model. You saw maybe saw that what's called outer sequence thrusting and the series of what are called duplexes. Um, and um, uh, this is exactly what Abhijit found um, in uh, from the seismic profiles. So we were very uh, pleased uh, to to see that. But yeah, of course, the seismic ac uh, hazards in the Himalaya uh, and in other regions um, uh, of India are tremendous, um, associated, of course, with the ongoing collision of India with Asia. Um, and it's a, it's a very serious um, uh, you know, public health issue, um, but it also reflects this dramatic and, 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 and exciting and, and unique history of the subcontinent. Yes, sir. So next we have Aviral Shivasta from Ramlal Anand College, University of Delhi. He asks, what type of dolomitization process may have co caused dolomitization in Zaskar? Ah, um, well, <laughs> um, um, uh, I would have to defer that to our previous speaker, um, uh, Morris Tucker, who you know taught me it. Well, I'm embarrassed to, to say that I can't really remember hardly anything about dolomitization um, uh, from my uh, from my long ago uh, uh, lectures from uh, Dr. Tucker. Um, but um, um, it, it, it is it is an, an, it's an interesting um, uh, phenomenon. Um, the um, there is of course a major unconformity between the Cambrian and the Ordovician in the western part of the Himalayas. It's called the Kurgayak uh, orogeny. It's a major event in um, Himalayan history that hasn't received enough uh, attention. It's a kind of pre-Himalayan um, orogeny that, uh, that occurred. Um, and um, the limestones in the, um, uh, the upper part of the, the Cambrian um, are, are dolomitized, the Karsha formation, as we said, um, the, the yellow band um, of Everest. Um, What's interesting is that if one goes down in the sequence, um, actually the dolomitization front um, drops off and you can find limestones and with fossils in. So the, the, the uh, Gingranaspis Shamalaya, the fossil named after Shamali Kostagir, um, and, and many like them are from the limestones that have not been affected by dolomitization. So my, um, this is maybe very naive, but my uh, thinking would be that the dolomitization that's occurred in the limestones of the Paraya formation and the Kasha formation is somehow related to that unconformity. Um, whether it took place um, during the, the time of uplift and exposure, um, uh, during the Kurgak orogeny, or whether it was just, you know, that was a surface that unconformity was a surface that later, at some subsequent point in geological time, you know, uh, acted as a kind of um, uh, conduit for dolomitization occurring. I, I don't really know. Um, but it is clear that um, non dolomitized limestones do occur lower in the, the succession there. And that's how we managed to find the fossils um, in, in limestones. 
Yes, sir. So next we have uh, Rahul Bhandari from Ramlal Anand College. He asks, during the collision of the Indian plate with Asia, the climate was warmer than usual. Did the climate of that time play any role in the sedimentation that succeeded this event? Well, the 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 um, the one of the things that's you know been so fascinating in my life as a geologist. I mean, you know, we we're we're all living in a really you know heyday kind of time for geology because um, you know people of my vintage. I, I mentioned that I got into. Uh, geology because of seeing a TV program, very early TV program when I was nine years old um, about continents smashing into one another. It might have been even talking about the Himalaya. Um, and I, you know, it's so dramatic and so uh, amazing that the world's geography can change. Um, and the same thing is, is true as, uh, you know, as we've gone through the whole discipline of geology, you know, things that were uh, separate fields that were disconnected, that were specialists, have started to connect again. So things like, you know, tectonic geology and uplift and erosion and, and the history of weather and climate and geochemistry and all these things um, have started to integrate in, in ways that we wouldn't have never have, have anticipated before. Um, so this whole relationship between um, the, the generation of the Himalayan mountains the uplift, the erosion, and the extent to which the erosion promotes further uplift, because of course mass is being removed. And we've been talking all about this breaking of the faults to the south and where that happens and what happens on one fault is different from another fault. All of that um, depends on the mass of material that and its distribution in the Himalayan mountain chain. And so if you have intense monsoon weathering in one region, removing a lot of mass, that's going to have profound implications <coughs> for what the tectonic evolution of that region is compared to uh, compared to another region. Where we've got, you know, we've got working in in Zanskar is fourteen thousand feet, totally dry in Zanskar. In Bhutan, same altitude wet and humid and 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 trees almost up to that region and this has a you know a big effect on the on the geometry of the of the mountain range and its erosion so you know it is an extremely exciting time because things like you know tectonic geology uh, igneous petrology all these areas that you wouldn't think would have anything to do with weathering and uplift and rivers and streams actually all these things connect together in a in a wonderful way, because that's how our work works. Thank you, sir. So, sir, next we have a question from Gokula from Ramlal Anand College. He asks, will Himalayas still have the highest peaks when the supercontinent Pangaea Proxima comes into existence? Uh, um, well, I don't think you should be any worried uh, at all the, uh, for for. Uh, the Himalaya maintaining its status as you know as uh, as the premier mountain chain um, of uh, of uh, our uh, uh, of, of this this era, um, of of course, um, um, uh, you know we uh, 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 you know uh, the the Earth of course over very long periods in history changes uh, uh, dramatically. Um, in terms of you know very uh, far distant future and what's going to to, to happen with mountain chains etc um, I'm not really um, well qualified to, to speak on that um, but um, you know one of the things that is uh, is happening in geology at the moment is um, is a, a lot more knowledge about um, the insights into things that we would have thought um, impossible to know uh, a few years ago. Like, you know, it probably will be possible to predict um, how high ancient mountain chains were um, in, in the past um, from our knowledge of basically the geography and climate systems and, you know, rocks that were impacting and uplifting and eroding. I think there's, uh, I have a vague feeling that, uh, uh, somebody uh, who was talking to me about this area in general, you know, the Himalayas is a pretty massive mountain range and, you know, it may not have been 
you know, it may be the, the biggest mountains that have ever existed, and perhaps not, but you know, it's a pretty big mountain chain. Um, uh, um, and of course, it is located at low latitudes with a lots of erosion and um, uplift. And, and this, this setting um, has a big effect on um, the, the dynamics of the origin. If this was occurring at, you know, near the poles, the whole system would be, you know, very different in its in its um, in in the way in which it's evolved. Um, so, um, uh, so I, I can't really answer the question of, you know, um, will the Himalayas uh, continue to? I mean, there's every indication that India will continue to collide and move northwards. It's still moving northwards. That's going to go on for a uh, uh, for a for a long time. Um, but uh, so I don't think we have anything to worry about the Himalayas losing their status, uh, uh, at least for um, as long as we have to, anything to worry about. Yes, sir. So uh, next we have uh, Shravya Srivastava from University of California, Riverside. She asks, do we see any change in exhum exhumation pattern of the older rocks in northwestern Himalayas to southeastern Himalayas. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting. Of course, Shravya asked me a question that I'm not really able to answer, probably, <laughs> um, 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 which is uh, which is uh, great. Um, um, yes, um, there are um, uh, uh, there, there, there certainly uh, uh, differences along the, the Himalayan margin in um, in in terms of what's exposed where, and I think. A lot of this relates to um, where these little pockets of um, the cover sequence, when, what, by that I mean it is true that um, the Lesser Himalaya in general is characterized by the um, outcrop of very old um, Proterozoic uh, rocks. Um, but there are these little patches, remnant patches, where the, the sequence that was covering that the Neo-Proterozoic and Cambrian sequence is, um, is preserved. Um, and um, that tends to be kind of sporadic. Um, uh, I'm not, you know, there, there are, even in the West, in, in, sorry, even in the East, in Arunachal and in Bhutan, you know, there are pockets of Neo-Proterozoic and possibly Cambrian rocks that are preserved in those regions too. Um, so um, I don't think one can say but well, well, what I do think one can say is that Pakistan, because of the oblique collision of India with Asia, Pakistan has um, experienced less deformation. So the reason why we have the salt range, for example, preserved in Pakistan um, is because the amount of collision in Pakistan and the, the deformation that's related to that is, is relatively reduced which means that those Cambrian rocks have not all been uplifted and already eroded a long time ago. Um, what, we, what we see when we're um, at that part of the origin that is 90 degrees to uh, India's collision with Asia, that's where uplift has been concentrated. And, and that's where the oldest rocks therefore are exposed in the Lesser Himalaya. So it kind of depends about the angle of India um, but um, we don't really have a very good complement on the eastern so side, excuse me, of what we have on the western side. Um, but that might be partly because the geology of um, Ankara and all the kind of um, Chittagong Hill tracks and all that region um, and, and up into Arunachal is not quite as well, you know, well constrained um, yet. But I think the, the, the major answer to that question is, you know, if you're if you're um, at ninety degrees to collision, that's where uplift is 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 concentrated. Although there are you know these little pockets, Pakistan because it's oblique has that more continuous record. Thank you so much, sir. Now I would like to have Rahul Bandari for the vote of thanks. Um. Thank you, Professor Nigel Hughes, for being with us here and for the marvelous and informative talk. You are exhilarated to host you. Uh, I would like to end by the translation of an Upanishad, which I hope Professor Nigel Hughes is acquainted with. It stirs and it stirs not. It is far and likewise near.
it is inside all of this and it is outside all of this i would like to thank um i go to ishar upanishad yep yes sir yeah. uh, i would like to thank our teachers uh, the dignitaries and the professors who joined today and also to the participants and the students uh, we hope you had a good time and this is rahul bandari from tedx signing out नमस्कार नमस्कार सर दिस कंक्लूड्स आर डे वन और So stay tuned for day two. We have two more webinars coming up. I would request the participants to kindly leave the meeting. मीटिंग एंड कर दे अभिरक्षण मीटिंग ओके शो गूगल मीट बना रहा हूँ